Hello, hello, hello. This is Rich Kale here on YouTube, Rich Gen X elsewhere, and it is time for us to return to Sherlock Holmes, Secret of the Silver Earring. Now, I hope you watch to the end. I do appreciate if you watch to the end. And uh, <clears throat> we are getting closer to the end of things here. Now, last time. We had uh, just sorted things out here at the uh, monastery, and it is now time uh, to... Hmm. Okay, let's go head off to Baker Street. Let us return to Sheringford Hall. Okay, now we're going to head to Sheringford Hall. It's an unnecessary middle step there, in my opinion. <sighs> oh, Dr. Watson. Beg pardon for imposing on you, mm. but I, I must get a message to Inspector Lestrade, and... He is just inside, and I am sure that he would be most eager to assist you. Yes. Uh, no. It would be better if he would hear this from you, rather than myself. The present situation requires me to be elsewhere. Please be good enough to tell Inspector Lestrade that I renounce any rights to the succession. Also, I will not be at my offices. I would not wish him to waste time looking for me there. Goodbye, and I thank you for your kind assistance, Dr. Watson. That's very curious. And there's Lestrade. I was upstairs and I could have sworn I just saw that blasted scoundrel Grimble through the window. Yes, you are right. But you have no chance of catching him now. He has run away as if the very devil himself were after him. It is not the devil that's after him, but myself. He would fare better if it were the devil on his trail. Hmm. He gave me a message for you, Lestrade. He said he renounces any rights to the succession. What do you say? This is astonishing news. This will not prevent me from finding him. I want to know how it so happens that a dead man is found in a building to which only Grimble is known to possess the keys. By the way, where is our great detective? Oh, here he comes now. Yep. <clears throat> Hello, gentlemen. What were you discussing? Grimble has renounced all possible rights to the succession of Bromsby Enterprises. But that does nothing to alter the fact that he is the ideal guilty party. Sir Bromsby had very important news that he intended to announce on the day of his death. What if this surprise news was the ouster of Grimble and Bromsby's intent to name his own daughter to succeed him? Do you think something otherwise, Holmes? No, it is nothing. May I ask you a question, Lestrade? <clears throat> Would it be possible to keep this new information about Grimble from Miss Bromsby but for a few days? It's a deuced odd request, but I presume that you must have your reasons. I will do my best to keep this information private till the day after tomorrow. Very good. Thank you, Lestrade. By the way, I would like to speak with Miss Bromsby. Where can I find her? I do believe she's with her faithful knight in her sitting room. This gentleman never, so to speak, leaves her side. Hmm. If this story spares them any further pain, no doubt they will soon be renowned as the most beautiful couple in London. I am trying not to think about it, but my heart feels heavy that I may have been an instrument of their sorrow. By the way, my brother Mycroft has answered one of my letters, and his information seems to be most interesting. You can look at it if you would like. I have had a copy made for you. Oh. oh well, more information is always good. Let's see what this is. Uh, the Kaldita Saba Abyss. Uh, Sherlock, with time of the yes. Of the essence, here is the information I managed to gather. W&G Company was founded by Joseph Grimble and his partner Raymond Waters. The majority of the capital was provided by Waters, who was the son of a wealthy ship owner. When Jay Grimble died in 1886, his shares passed according to his, his will to his partner, Mr. Waters. The business of the Kaladisa Abyss is one of... <clears throat> That what we as British people are loath to remember, 
In the entire history of colonization, we have played falsely with the image we claim for ourselves. The truth of this murky business is still protected by the military authorities, so I possess but a small portion of the facts of the matter. Because of the Kalidasa Abyss, the supply convoys of the garrisons from the northwest of Bombay had to make long detours. A decision was reached to construct a bridge over the abyss. The construction was entrusted to a contractor who enjoyed strong support within the military echelons, a Mr. Melvin Romsby. Romsby committed to perform this task in a time frame that many specialists considered extremely ambitious, given the difficulties associated with the location and of practic other practicalities. The abyss was situated in the middle of a jungle located in a distant and isolated place. A battalion was assigned to ensure the security of construction efforts that would take several months. One of the officers from, from this battalion Form this battalion was Captain Lowry. From the beginning, nothing went right with the project. They talk of how poor the soil proved to be and the recurring accidents. The rains from ritual sacrifice were found at the bottom of the abyss, which caused fear in the superstitious Hindu workers. There was also the presence of a man-eating tiger nearby and other exotic mysteries. Thus, in the next few weeks, the construction suffered considerable delays. At the start of the second month, the officers in charge of the battalion asked to be retained in their role of supervision. Regardless of their personal hardships with this assignment, the command in Bombay supported their request as it was a great opportunity to econ Economize the cost of construction, which were considerable. Then the officers asked for men from the nearby village and the towns to strengthen the teams on site. Soldiers following the convoys complained that large barriers barred their view of the site and prevented an assessment of its progress. They were also denied passage beyond these enclosures. They further noted that although. <clears throat> that although they brought workers to the site, they had never escorted any from the place and back to their homes. They were also deeply concerned that they could not identify the source of an unbearably foul stench that surrounded the work site. Some people claimed that they had fallen ill merely from breathing the smoke from some invisible fire that came from the impenetrable mound. The construction was eventually completed and or near schedule, on or near schedule, I bad. But as inconceivable numbers of Indian families still do not know what happened to their husband, father, son, or brother, they left one day to build this bridge, never to be seen nor heard from again. One of the officers, Captain Lowry, tried to reveal the truth that everyone preferred be left unknown. He was abandoned by his superiors and his comrades. He wanted to leave Bromsby and applied for the post of principal at a penitentiary in Italy. It occurs frequently with non-commissioned officers, as there is no better director than a former officer of the British Army. Everyone knows it and is envious because of it, but the Army refused to grant him leave. They threatened him with charges of desertion if he left the Indian Territory. There must have been, they must have been afraid that one day he would reach England and find attentive ears for a story which must not be told. He died ill and alone, and here is a strange request for a soldier of the British Army. He asked to be cremated in the Indian manner. This last request was in fact refused by the Army. All of his property was bequeathed to the military orphanage, Rahami in Bombay. Hopes that this information shall provide you some help. Good luck. Interesting. All right. Now. Now we're not running now. I hear laughter coming from the powder room. Harrington and Lavinia.
Hiya. Good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. James has just been showing me the photographs from his hunts. Oh, but I wasn't the only hunter. My respects, Miss Bromsby. Hello, Lieutenant. If I could have a look. Hmm, I must say, this is quite a handsome specimen, but it is surprising how light it appears. That ball weighed near a thousand stones. No, beg pardon. I was referring to your portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> That is but another souvenir of my travels to Africa. Interesting. I came here specifically to inform you that everything goes well with the case, Miss Bromsby. But I need to ask you a question of a more personal nature. Mm -hmm. If the lieutenant would be so gallant as to give us a moment of privacy. Your servant, Mr. Holmes. I will retire to the smoking room. Does this photograph belong to you? Yes, it's mine. This is the photo of an actress who was with their touring London company. They gave a performance at the town near my boarding school in Switzerland. Mm. This is Miss Davenport. She was kind enough to meet with us in her dressing room after the show. I see. And how would you describe this actress? Oh, yes. she was fascinating, on the stage and in life as well. She personally inscribed this likeness for me. You see, they were available for purchase during the intermission. She was so very beautiful. Interesting. Hey, continue. When I met with her, she showed me this beautiful earring that she wore. It was in the shape of a wave with foam made entirely of sparkling stones. <laughs> it's strange, but I have never talked about this with anyone till now. I do hope I'll see you again someday. Perhaps. <clears throat> now, listen to me, my dear child. I must ask you to speak to no one about our conversation, not under any circumstances. The discovery of the truth rests on your silence. Okay. I've got to go now. I understand. All right. And now we're heading back to Baker Street. This lieutenant seems a very commendable person. Miss Lavinia is fortunate to have him near. Mm. Lestrade was saying that he has found more evidence of Grimble's trail. The corpse we found at the cement factory may well have been an accomplice and the true murderer of Sir Bromsby. Grimble could have easily obtained an invitation for him to the reception. Then, some time after the deed was done, Grimble eliminated his accomplice to prevent his speaking. Or perhaps not. Yeah, whatever are you musing about, Holmes? Hmm. Holmes? What is it, Watson? Oh, blast it, Holmes! You haven't heard a word that I have said. It is of no consequence. Tell me, have you had the opportunity to redeem the item with the receipt we found at Hunter's? Hmm. Oh, yes. It was a simple matter. In order to get the best price, Hunter agreed to redeem the item within two days' time. Look, these appear to be real diamonds. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. It seems to me that we have gathered all of the key elements, Watson. However, before we retire, let's summarize our findings. Yes. The question should be answered yes or no, and justified by the evidence or testimony received during the investigation. Yes. Was the leader of the thugs who attacked Holmes directly connected to the case? Yes. And we can justify that by the... by this. The Wong J document. Can we say the person who killed Simon Hunter is skilled with weapons? Yes. And this we can do by the dialogue we had with Mr. Appleby. Okay. Are the ruins near Richmond's Abbey a common haunt for wanderers? Yes, they are. Brother at 
at the Abbey. Can the handwriting on the message found in the ruins be the same that as that on a previous document? Yes, in fact, uh, we know that. Threat WC. Threat W. Is it easy for a retired English officer to find a find work as a prison warden abroad? Yes, we just read that. Okay. And that. It is simplicity itself, Watson. Yes, we have. We have answered all the questions. Alrighty. And here comes Lestrade. Hello, Watson. Good morning, Lestrade. You are an early riser. Yes. Good morning, Lestrade. You look really tired. You must have had a lengthy meeting with the minister. But hold on, how on earth could you know that, Holmes? I can read you like an open book. <laughs> <laughs> I jest with you, gentlemen. <laughs> it's not the proper time for jesting, Holmes. But upon my word, how did you find out about the minister? I was assured that only three or four persons at most had knowledge of this meeting. <laughs> oh, I would rather withhold my explanation. So you must be aware of the subject of the meeting. Indeed, but Dr. Watson knows nothing of these events. Well, our incorruptible yet ever practical minister shared the thoughts of the Chancellor of the Exchequer with me. I decided that it would be most imprudent, given the crisis we're under, for a young lady, barely 18 years of age, to take control over one of the country's three biggest building enterprises. I begin to understand, but... According to the minister, despite his bad habits due to the lack of consideration for his partner, Grimble is the only individual that the council has faith in to reverse the current state of the Bromsby Holdings. It was further explained to me that if there is a choice to make in the direction of my investigation, and lacking any new evidence to the contrary, I must take these concerns into account. This is outrageous. And you, Lestrade, what are your personal thoughts on the matter? I really can't say, Holmes. The prospect offered by Grimble seems so attractive. He had credible motive to murder Bromsby and then foul it. In yeah. addition, he was the only individual with apparent access to the shed at the cement factory where we discovered the corpse of his presumed accomplice. However, the only gadfly to this theory is his statement to Dr. Watson when he clearly renounced all rights of succession. That is an item of singular curiosity. It is difficult for me to believe that a man who could plan and execute two or three murders with such cool presence of mind would give up an opportunity of this magnitude so easily. I also have spent sufficient time at Sherringford Hall to have a high opinion of Lieutenant Harrington. I agree with you. This young man, by all accounts, has an unimpeachable character. I have no evidence to cast doubt on the truthfulness of his testimony. We yeah. reconstructed the crime, and it was evident from where he stood he could easily see Miss Bromsby despite the crowd. Really, Holmes, I'm not a man who would hand over an innocent girl to the executioner, even should it cost me my career. I am pleased to hear you say this, Lestrade. By the way, yeah. Lestrade, have you any knowledge of the place known as Aston's Theatre? Is it that shabby theatre that lies near the bank of the Thames? Yes. Several weeks ago, it was acquired by the Fairfax Theatre Company. Their international tour appears to have been most successful, as they are set to open their new play in a week. Dwight Richards happens to be their director. Hmm. You mean the author of the threatening letter that we found on Bromsby's desk? I must admit, I thought the letter to be of small consequence. After all, it involved a matter from so long ago. Yes. Sometimes old wounds are the most painful. In fact, we are leaving for Aston's right now. I know that you are quite busy, but if you feel like joining us, meet us at noon. Yes. Okay, so we are at Aston's tier. And what's this? This might be interesting. After its triumphant tour of three continents, Fairfax Theatre Company is pleased to present the exclusive world premiere of Vagrancy and Profilism. 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 
by S. Prescott with Carolyn Small and Riley Wilcox, staged by the author, company director Dwight Richards. Okay. Time to enter the building. Aston Theatre. Here we are. We are not open to the public yet, gentlemen. Oh, bless my soul. I can hardly believe my eyes. It is the young Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Watson, yeah. allow me to present Philotomy Curvy, who in his day was one of the last great hopes of the popular stage. He also took great pains to advance my comprehension of the many subtleties of the theatrical arts. Yeah. So he can still prattle away. Don't listen to him. This is the most talented student I've ever met, upon my word, as an actor. Yeah. But those days are past. So, am I speaking to the former actor or the world-renowned detective today? Ah. Tell me, what you know about the Fairfax Theatre Troupe? Two months ago, they returned from an international tour. Richards, their director, had managed to secure the necessary funds to buy back Aston's. It seems he had finally resolved his troubles. Oh! He was in some kind of trouble. Oh, bah. It's always the same with those tours abroad. Your star actress marries an emir. Another time the entire troupe has their luggage stolen. Anything is possible. And whatever occurs is usually nothing good. Mm. But who would have imagined such a tragedy? What tragedy? What tragedy? Their last tour started about three years ago. At that time, the troupe was housed at the Fairfax Theatre. But a series of failures forced the owners to sell it at a substantial loss. The owners were three individuals. Dwight Richards, their current director, Miss Davenport, their star actress, and the mistress of Richards, and lastly, a young actor, costumier, makeup man called Jeffries. They decided, Jeffries. after the sale, to launch an international tour in order to raise funds. Their success was assured? Yes, the fame of English theatre is worldwide. During their travels, Jeffries and Miss Davenport developed a close relationship. Hmm. It was much to the regret of the hot-headed Richards. He is a gypsy by birth. No one can be more possessive and quick-tempered than a gypsy. Hmm. Pray continue. In short, a dark tragedy occurred in a village in Latin America, located not far from the Amazon. Oh. One evening, after their performance, someone noticed that Miss Davenport and Jeffreys had gone missing. The local authorities were notified, and the alarm was raised. Mm. And Richards? Yes. Richards was implicated in some manner, it seems to me. However, there was no proof of his involvement, and no bodies were ever found. What a strange case. If you need more details, you should ask the actors. As you may observe, they are rarely able to hold their tongues. I will see you later, Kirby. Yes, it was good seeing you again. Now I want to walk over here. Uh-huh, yep. Let's talk to this gentleman here. Hello, young man. What are you looking at? Yes. I'm sorry. You startled me. I'm looking at her. Her. Are you from the press? Of course no. you are. You must be here to interview her. Oh, the play is wonderful. And Miss Caroline will surely shine. If only my father could have seen this day. Your father? Your father? 
Yes, I am Bruce Aston, and my father was Clyde Aston, the former owner of the theatre. It may have fallen into some disrepair, but during its time it was well loved by so many. A host of young actors debuted on that venerated stage. Why, it was at this very spot where Mr. Richards first met Miss Davenport. Oh! Have you ever heard of the Fairfax Theatre? Yes. It is the theatre which was demolished. It seems to me that it had been owned by Mr. Richards together with Miss Davenport and a friend of theirs. They left on an extended tour, but I think it went badly for them. After his return, Mr. Richards bought the theatre back from the bank, and I do hope his good fortune will continue. Well, we can hope. With the talented Miss Caroline, I think anything is possible. And the building is still solid and comfortable. Though the bank took over the theatre, they left the keys. From time to time, I would do what I could to tidy up a bit or see to a broken window. Hmm. Are you a part of the troupe? Yes. When Mr. Richards noticed how I had worked to keep the place up, he hired me. I helped Mr. Kirby a little, and also Mr. Trumpet backstage. Hmm. Goodbye, young man. Goodbye, sir. Alright, let's talk with this gentleman. Excuse me, may I ask you some questions? Naturally, I'm listening to you. Ah. You are rehearsing at the moment, aren't you? Yes, we are in rehearsal for the play we are to perform at the month end. Are you critics or reporters? As you know, we just came back from an extended tour. We yeah, she did. triumph everywhere we performed. Tell us about this international tour. Yes. We performed in France, in Switzerland, and even for an Arab prince. We were met with acclaim at every stop. If tragedy had not occurred, we were to appear next in New York. But fate had other plans for oh. us. What sort of tragedy? Yes. Oh, surely you must have heard about it. All because of those in our company who assume the right to reveal every distasteful and intimate detail of a most tragic event. Anything to gain publicity for themselves. It is positively scandalous. But even a professional actor such as myself respects the privileges of the press and the public's right to know. Your sensitivity honours you. Please, continue your story. Yeah. The events took place in a most sorry place in Brazil named Guacamole or Babiamo or something like that. I still can't stop asking myself what we were doing there in the first place. But to be brief, our talented costumier, Mr. Jeffries, had been having a tete-a-tete -tete with the beautiful Miss Davenport. Unfortunately, she was still very much the mistress of our director, Mr. Richards. I tell you, the tension was unbearable. I believe it. In the view of a professional, they were the worst hours of my life. Miss Davenport was spending the whole day closeted in her room. Mr. Jeffries trembled so uncontrollably that he was unable to do our makeup. Mr. Richards stepped in, and I must say, he was a pitiful substitute. May you never be so ill-fortuned as to have your face in his large, hairy hands. I see. And then? The first performance in that town was naturally well received. That very night, a tragedy took place. Mr. Jeffries and Miss Davenport went missing not long after the performance ended. It was impossible to find them. Then, we heard that Mr. Richards was arrested on suspicion of murder regarding Miss Davenport and Mr. Jeffries. We were outraged and most indignant. Some entertained thoughts that we would never leave that godforsaken place. How was the matter resolved? Yes. Fortunately for Mr. Richards and all of us, the prison warden and the local chief of police was an Englishman. Lacking direct evidence or even a corpse, the accusations against Mr. Richards could not stand. He was set free on the spot. 
I think that had it not been for the intervention of that young expatriate, we might have been stranded in that Amazonian swamp for all eternity. I see. Well, thank you for your assistance. That's all right. Don't hesitate to seek my help. <laughs> well, I want to finish talking with the people here. Then we'll call it an episode. Don't listen to that milk toast. He gets positively weak in the knees over redheads. A policeman is just a policeman. That's it. If Richards isn't in jail, it's only because he had nothing to do there. Hmm. We were talking about the tragedy which occurred during your previous tour, and... You aren't the yeah. press, are you? No. No. In my opinion, you seem more like policemen. Well, listen closely, inspectors. Miss Davenport was nothing more than an aging woman who adored seeing all the men at her feet. What? Don't you mean... She joined with Richards and Jeffreys like two little puppets. Dwight Richards is good with temper, but he wouldn't harm a hair on her head. And, and you are eager to be so helpful. Please, find my red hair wig. Okay, she needs a red hair wig. We must continue our investigation. Of course, of course. Talk to the young lady here. Hello, miss. I'm sorry for disturbing you. Oh, you're well welcome. Are you here for some new thing? Yes, yeah. we are hard at work. Excuse, Excuse me, did, did I just tease the expert her calling you new homes? Is it really possible that you and your great great detective shall have homes? And you and your doctor Watson? Well, she knows of us. I'm a mess that is my fact that the hair 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 bed bed was with her during her last war. Oh, I see. You're interested in the case. Still a little bit mystery, even though it's over there. Yes? Tell us about Miss Davenport. She was a sad body. Positively mesmerized men. She confessed that she had been an indiscreet with our student ginger chosers. She had left, left Richards before. She, she was came back to him. She said he said he understood her completely. I agree with him. Hmm. Until that ah. was his time. Huh. Forgive an admiring expert, but your earring is absolutely oh, magnificent. Oh, that was a gift, gift from Veronica. She got a lot of matching earrings and small jewel case. She gave me this, this one, another to Doris, and came over to be for herself. For an assistant cleansing itself, a special cleanser. It was remarkable and kept the earring all sparkling like stars. And when I saw her last, Veronica was wearing her earring. She never parted with it. Hmm. And where will we find Doris? She must be in her dressing room. Okay. Goodbye, miss, and thanks. You're welcome, Mr. Holmes. And with that, uh, we're going to head into the dressing room, and next time around, we will, uh, the plan is to talk with Doris. Oh, yeah. So, in the next episode, and uh, it might be our final episode, we will talk with Doris. As we can see, it looks like she's sort of floating through the chair there. <laughs> I do hope you have watched to the end, as I greatly appreciate it. This is Rich Kale here on YouTube, Rich Gen X elsewhere. Uh, like I said, next time we will probably be finishing this game. And uh, that just shows to how quick you can get through this game. It's one of the shorter ones. It's very possible. And we'll get to the end of this mystery. Uh, check out some of the other game, Sherlock Holmes games I've played through. I'm playing through them in a chronological order. Not in the order that they were released, but as the order they happen in the series internal chronology. So play through uh, at the time of this recording. I've played through Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper, Sherlock Holmes The Awakened, Sherlock Holmes Crimes and Punishments, and Sherlock Holmes Nemesis. Uh, once Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 comes out, I'll probably pick that up, and that will be played after whatever title I'm working on at the time of the recording. I'm also working my way through uh, other games, like the 2010 release of Aliens vs. Predator. 
I am working my way through just had a brain fart there. <laughs> um, I just recently finished the Henry Stickman collection, so the next title up, you'll find out when it premieres. <laughs> Which, if you watch these in order that they're released, uh, you'll see it come up in about two days. I am working my way through The Witness, which is a nice, quiet, relaxing game. And I am working my way through... Let me see, my brain just did a brain fart there. I'm working my way through the Zork franchise. Currently, and that's in a chronological order, I'm working on Zork Zero, which is technically the, either the fourth or fifth game release, but it's the first in the series timeline. I'm also working my way through Gibbous, a Cthulhu adventure, a very fun game, has a snarky cat in it. Uh, probably going to reach the end of that one soon, too. I just have that feeling. And I'm also working my way uh, through uh, the Tales of Monkey Island, the last of the Monkey Island franchise. I'm on Chapter 4 of that particular title, and I'm working through the 2018 release of... Hall of Cthulhu. And there's a lot more stuff up on the channel. I do some runs through the game of Monstrum and putting some runs up on Monstrum 2. I am reading through some prose work of mine and that goes up as well as I started to put some videos up on a Wednesday morning as well. And uh, I also put up a retrospective every weekend for the games that I have completed. And at the current uh, <clears throat> at the current <laughs> rate, I might end up getting through a whole catch up to the games I haven't completed yet <laughs> with these things. But who knows? Who knows what will happen in the meantime? So again, until next time, this is Rich Kale here on YouTube, Rich Gen X elsewhere. Please subscribe and as always, have fun. Bye.